Uh, I'm Jerry Kirsch. I was the chair of the local organizing committee. Um, and in two hours, I will exhale um, for the first time in months. <clears throat> um, thank you all for um, participating uh, in this meeting. Um, all of the participants will receive a, um, a survey to fill out. And we really need your help. We really need to know both what worked, but what didn't work, and then what did we miss entirely so that we can continually plan uh, and improve the quality of the CUGH annual meeting. Um, before I introduce uh, um, Michelle Barry, who will uh, co-moderate the session with, with Peter Piot, um, I just wanted to show a, a couple of slides, if uh, you could put um, that up. Uh, if you weren't here this morning, um, this is for you. Um, we, um, we wanted to uh, pay attention to the next generation of global health leaders who are our uh, graduate students in the various disciplines that are relevant to, to global health, which is virtually everything. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we decided that uh, we should go uh, progressively younger generations. So we made some invitations to uh, college undergraduates from institutions locally. As you know, Boston not only has a lot of snow, but we also have a lot of colleges and universities and students. And so we were, we were blessed with a bunch of undergrads who joined us. Um, and, uh, and then we went out to some of the high schools uh, in Boston, the public schools uh, in, in Boston and in Worcester, um, and um, some of the uh, private schools in the uh, neighborhood, uh, where they have strong science-based programs with uh, global literacy um, for young um, high school students. So a bunch of juniors and, uh, and seniors um, have, uh, have come uh, to participate in this meeting. Uh, there's a group from Madison Park uh, Technical Vocational High School. I don't know if you already showed the others. You did. Great. So um, uh, I, I wanted to um, particularly say welcome to this group of kids and their science teachers um, who are present here. Um, and that's the next, next generation. And um, I'm going to urge Jaime Sepulveda um, to get middle schoolers into the San Francisco meeting. Um, that's uh, basically all I wanted to say, except I have the pleasure of, of introducing uh, Michelle uh, Barry, who is going to uh, bring the panel up and, and, uh, and with Peter moderate the session. Um, Michelle is a long-term long -term friend and um, colleague. Uh, unexpectedly, a couple of years ago, uh, we met each other in a grocery store in the Berkshires in western Massachusetts. Um, where we both try to spend as much time as, as possible. And uh, Michelle, in her wisdom, even though she's now moved to um, California, uh, still finds time to come and enjoy the, the beauty of the Berkshires. Um, she's a, uh, a major figure in uh, global health, um, has done a remarkable number of things, and I don't exactly know what her, her title is. I think. Um, Tim used it the opening day of Grand Puba or something like that for global health at Stanford and innovation and, and everything else. So Michelle, come on up. Thank you, Jerry. Um, You're right. I'm Michelle Berry, and I am the director of the Center for Innovation and Global Health at Stanford. Um, so welcome to the, the Ebola plenary session. So e Ebola may be off the front pages of mainstream media, but it's very up and front and personal for the West African countries struggling with the disease currently. There are still 10 to 15 new cases a day in Guinea and Sierra Leone, and Liberia, which was case-free for almost 30 days, um, just reported this morning not one, but three new cases. 
Um, so clearly this epidemic is still going on and the struggle to reach Ebola zero continues as well as the moral imperative to reflect upon lessons learned um, and how we can do better as a global health community in global biosurveillance and strengthening. So, Peter Piat has arranged a powerhouse of experts uh, to be on this panel. I'm gonna ask them to come up to the panel um, while I start to introduce um, our first speaker. So, can the panelists come up? And I'm gonna introduce, and it doesn't matter where you sit, because we'll, we'll play musical chairs or juggle or whatever. Um, it, it's, I'm gonna start with our first speaker, um, which is Peter Piat, my co-moderator. And again, I am not gonna spend much time going through all the honors and accomplishments because that could take the entire time um, of this panel. So very eclectic and short. Um, so Peter is the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he's also the past founding director of UN AIDS and undersecretary of the UN. Um, he's also, I have to say this, because it was announced at CUGH, um, the winner of the recent winner of the Gairdner Award um, for Infectious Diseases and Global Health, often known as the pre-Nobel Prize. Uh, he's, he, but the most important thing in the, and why he's on this panel is, is, is he is really an icon in Ebola, and he was part of the original international team that went into the first outbreak in DRC um, and helped identify the virus along with his many collaborators, which he very generously shared with us a few days ago. So Peter, I'm gonna have you talk. Oops, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion here, and in the sake of time, I'll be uh, quite short in my own comments. Uh, also, because I uh, extensively discussed my, uh, my role and uh, my uh, involvement with Ebola in, the, uh, in 1976 and, and, and afterwards. And, um, and I'm delighted that uh, Professor Jean-Jacques Muyembe from Kinshasa is here with us because he was the first person to collect specimens and, uh, um, you know, co including um, biopsy as, and uh, autopsy samples from uh, the known cases of Ebola in, also in 1976. And um, so yesterday, at, as I said, at the, the Gardner Award lecture, um, I, I went into these details. And I would say that the, um, one of the, the lessons from the current Ebola outbreak, as I mentioned, is that Never assume that things cannot change, um, because the um, common wisdom and uh, uh, the, the dogma even was that um, Ebola outbreaks are by definition only occurring in Central Africa, with one exception of the Tsai forest strain in Cote d'Ivoire, that um, they're always limited in time, place, and person, and, uh, and that they are fairly easy to uh, contain. And all that we know today is um, not necessarily uh, the case. And so we should never assume that uh, uh, things remain as they are. And uh, why in the first place? Because the, um, the world is changing. Uh, it's not so much the virus that has changed as far as we know today, but it's because, um, no, we are um, far more mobile. We have, um, you know, in the case of uh, West Africa now, what I call the a perfect storm, um, which is characterized by um, very fragile systems coming out of um, you know, a civil war and uh, fragile states um, with um, traditional beliefs, uh, health systems that are not functioning. Uh, it's always interesting to see that there are people who now discover because of Ebola that it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a functional health system, that, uh, that it took that. But uh, above all also, I would say that uh, the Ebola outbreak and crisis in West Africa has revealed major fault lines in local societies, in the international system, uh, in how we conduct uh, research and uh, develop new drugs and uh, new vaccines, and um, also, um, I would say, in 
uh, trust and the, um, the way that uh, international uh, aid and uh, development and cooperation is, uh, is operating. Um, above all, I think it is um, the lack of initial response both and denial, both locally, nationally, and internationally, that um, uh, has led us to the situation we're in now. And as we heard from Michel, it's not over. Um, so some words about um, the um, few aspects that I think will not be raised by others. One, um, on this international response. In the, in the UK, um, the, as you know, the engagement has been particularly with Sierra Leone and um, both uh, Jeremy Farrar, who's here, director of the Wellcome Trust, and uh, myself will be quite intimately involved in planning it, organizing it. And I think from the perspective from when you're in London, it seems all going very well, um, well coordinated out of the prime minister's office. And um, we also um, are lucky to have a national health system or health service, and uh, uh, which provided after a long, um, well, I would say lag time um, to have physicians and nurses and other healthcare workers who could go. Um, and, but we don't have a CDC or an epidemic intelligence service and to, to rely on. Um, that is uh, something that we feel is a big gap. Um, the, um, on the academic side, in uh, uh, late August, I sent an email to all staff of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, encouraging people to volunteer to go to West Africa, provided they are going through um, bona fide um, uh, organizations, including um, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, WHO, and uh, Save the Children, and later on also the, Inter the Federation of Red Cross Societies. And the response was overwhelming. I'm glad I never consulted with any lawyer or whatever, that, uh, so, uh, because we may still have been talking about whether, how to do this. But um, I feel strongly, and since we are here in a CUGH, the U is universities, that we do have a moral responsibility as universities, that we have a critical role in society. Uh, critical in the sense of essential, but also critique of what's going on and that's one of our major, um, major jobs. We also shouldn't forget that um, not only did many academic institutions speak with a forked tongue, many governments, on the one hand giving money and uh, talking about it, but on the other hand uh, creating all kinds of obstacles for people to go. Um, airlines stopping to fly. Um, I mean, we can have a whole list uh, that really uh, increased the cost and the difficulties for international um, assistance um, to countries that were uh, struggling. It's not over. Um, I think that, um, uh, and even if things have gotten better, what strikes me is that um, news uh, about the Ebola outbreak is extremely limited now in the media, the coverage, and sometimes you hear it's not that bad, but when you have 10 new cases a, a day, uh, Normally, that's a cause for panic. Now it's kind of not too bad. Um, so that's the normalization of a, of a catastrophe, which worries me very, very much, because it is definitely not impossible that this will be a long and bumpy ride. Uh, I'm not going to try to predict anything, because I think modeling has been um, notoriously wrong uh, for when it came to uh, long-term uh, predictions, but quite accurate for shorter term uh, predictions of the trajectory of the epidemic. But with the um, decline of uh, cases, we're also facing new challenges from how long can you sustain a very intense emergency response? I mean, this the emergency response is um, done by people. And, uh, you know, there is a limit, uh, a minimum number of hours of sleep you need, etc. cetera. So, and, and as a society, how long can you do that? How long can you tell people, of, uh, you know, of, um, um, of completely uh, changing their uh, behavior? How long can the schools remain closed? And so on and so on. How long can hospitals remain closed and um, 
and, and so leading to um, mortality from other diseases. So new challenges also in terms of strategy. I always think, you know, how on earth are we going to know for sure that the last person with Ebola infection has either died or recovered without having infected anybody in three entire countries and, uh, and also the surrounding countries and uh, not making sure there's no reintroduction. Uh, are we making best use also of science today uh, in terms of, for example, sequencing of isolates and so that we can refine our epidemiology, contact tracing and so on because we need to know much better what's going on. And also, um, the worst thing we could do from a research perspective because, again, we are COGH here, would be to say we can now um, just uh, take it easy in terms of testing, developing new vaccines and, and uh, new treatments. But we have failed in, uh, at many, many levels. And at the, uh, on the research side, I think we have failed um, of um, being ready for it, um, for um, it being new products, the social science research, um, failed of really shaking up the regulatory um, rules um, where, again, we say, oh, yes, this is an emergency, but then immediately going back to normal and not being open to any alternative study designs and all that, and thereby really <coughs> limiting the speed um, with which we can do research under very difficult uh, circumstances. So we have a lot of lessons to, to learn, um, but I always say never miss a good crisis, um, and um, we have many uh, lessons to learn, not only about Ebola itself, and, uh, you know, uh, outbreaks that turn into a uh, crisis, um, but also about sharing data from governments to academic institutions. We, I think, some of the worst behavior science has come up and some of the, worst be the, the, the best behavior, as it always is the case. But also reflecting on um, epidemic preparedness, um, issues around development, health system strengthening, and so on. So that's why it's really important that there are a number of panels and committees looking at this, uh, all these issues uh, through different lenses and doing it now. Because the risk is always when it's over that it's over in people's mind and that we go back to, to normal. This has happened so many times. And, uh, uh, you know, and it, why didn't SARS give rise to uh, a global reflection and a change in what we're doing um, we cannot let uh, Ebola go for uh, the same way because the least we owe to people who have died and who have suffered and infected and, and uh, you know, the havoc that has been uh, caused by this epidemic is to learn lessons from it and act on them um, collectively. And here, as an academic community, we have a really important role to play. So thank you very much. And thank you. We're going to break to have some robust, robust Q&A afterwards, but I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, um, who is Professor of Microbiology and Director General of the National Institute of the Biomedical Research in the DRC. Um, he's a well-known icon in the field of emerging hemorrhagic viruses. Um, and actually, I have to say, this week also, he just won the Miryu Award um, for fighting infectious diseases in developing countries. Um, so. Very big honor. But I, I think the most poignant thing that Peter shared with me last night um, is Dr. Muyembe, Professor Muyembe was that really the first person to touch a patient with Ebola and actually did an autopsy, I believe. Um, and is here to talk about it and give us his reflections, and I'm very glad he's here. <laughs> um, but anyway, he's going to talk to us about an overview of what it was like at the beginning. Professor. I have my notes there, so I, I will use it. I will use it. Okay. Um, When I arrived here for the first time, I think 15 years ago, 
I, I was, uh, yeah, when I arrived here for the first time 15 years ago, I think, I was invited by Jerry. And um, when I arrived, it was too hot. So I sent a message to my family. I cannot uh, live here because it is too hot. <laughs> and today, when I arrive, I send a message. It is snowing here. I cannot stay. OK. So um, yes, I come here to, uh, to share with you my uh, adventure uh, about uh, Ebola. If you like uh, adventures, OK, please accompany me. Um, but uh, my English is not so good. It is why I will uh, try to read what uh, I have written. So uh, on September 21st, 1976, there was an alert of a deadly mysterious disease at the Catholic mission of Yambuku, Bumba Health Zone, Equator Province. From 5 to 22 September, 30 cases were notified with 22 deaths. The disease was not responding to anti-malaria and to antibiotics usually used in the country. The alert was attributed to typhoid fever or to uh, yellow fever. It is why on 23 September, the Minister of Health uh, asked me to go and assess the situation. So I was the first scientist to arrive at the outbreak epicenter in Yambuku. And on the evening of uh, my arrival there, a lot, uh, excuse me, on the evening of, uh, of September 23rd, uh, I arrived with a lot of antibiotics and anti-malaria drugs. The hospital of Yambuku was empty. But in the morning of the following day, when the population learned that uh, doctors have arrived from Kinshasa to Yambuku, several patients uh, started to, to, to go to come to the hospital. After a quick physical exam of some of them, I decided to collect blood samples for blood culture and with our test to confirm, to confirm typhoid fever diagnosis. I did so without gloves. What astonished me was the fact that when I removed the needle, blood continued to flow at the site of puncture. I have never seen that before during my, uh, my <laughs> medical studies. My fingers were also soiled with blood. I was lucky washing my hands with soap and disinfectant I brought from Kinshasa. We also collected liver fragment from three corpses of nurses who died the night of my arrival. While we were taking a lunch with the sister, one of the nuns, who was also taking care of the patients in the hospital, told me that she has fever and headache. Immediately, I stopped eating and rushed in her, in her room for a brief 
exa uh, physical exam. And I noticed, I noticed some disseminated petitia on her body. Moments later, another, uh, a Belgian father of the, of the mission joined us at the lunch, saying that he also has fever and headache. So uh, it is why we decided to shorten our stay, to pack our samples, and to go back to Bumba with the sick uh, father and the sick sister, who was accompanied by uh, another sister. So we, we, we travel in a car, side by side with the sick sister. The following day, we flew from uh, Bumba to Kisangani in a regular plane. And we, uh, we, we, we had connection uh, with another plane in Kisangani to go to Kinshasa. Blood sample was processed in my lab at the University of uh, Kinshasa. Blood culture were, uh, were negative, but two patients had high titers of, uh, of antibodies to somatic and flagellar antigen of Salmonella typhi, Salmonella typhi, typhi. But this was not uh, uh, conclusive because uh, with our test is not specific. And the pathology results of postmortem liver samples were more striking as one of the samples had an histological aspect of uh, yellow fever. So the question was, is, is that a yellow an outbreak of yellow fever or not? But the remaining were negative. Meantime, the disease of the sick sister, who was hospitalized at, uh, uh, at uh, Ngaliema Hospital in Kinshasa, was worsening. Her blood was uh, collected and sent to Institute of Tropical Medicine, where Professor Peter Piot was working. Some day later, the sister died. The accompanying sister became sick and died. Uh, one Congolese nurse who took care of them became sick and died. It was hard to imagine the, the countdown of my life. So twice a day, I checked my body temperature for 42 days. That is the, the double of the incubation period of the mysterious disease that will be known as Ebola, hemorrhagic fever. When you have seen a case of Ebola, you will never forget it. My second experience or adventure was in 1995 in Kikwit, Bandundu province. An outbreak of, of, uh, uh, of bloody diarrhea was killing people in Kikwit, a city of, uh, of uh, 400, 400,000 uh, inhabitants. Healthcare workers, Catholic nurse, uh, nurse, nuns working in the hospital were among the victims. After a brief physical exam of the sick nurse I found there, I collected also uh, bacteriology information and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and carry out a brief uh, epidemiological uh, 
history of the, of the, of the disease, and I found links between, between cases, between cases. So quickly, I arrived at the conclusion, with my uh, previous experience, I arrived at the conclusion that that is not the blood diarrhea caused by uh, um, Shigella dysenteriae, but this must be Ebola, uh, a viral hemorrhagic uh, fever, maybe Ebola. It is why I collected, I collected uh, samples and sent to uh, CDC. And CDC confirmed that it was an outbreak of, of, uh, of Ebola. So uh, my reflection is that in 1976, when I saw the first cases of the deadly, mysterious disease, now known as Ebola virus disease, when I collected blood samples and post-mortem liver fragments for pathology diagnosis, I could not imagine that Ebola disease will become one day a public health emergency of international concern. It is an exceptional privilege for me to witness such an evolution. Thank you for your attention, and please practice the Ebola greetings like this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be very quick because we're going to try to get through our whole panel. Um, so it's been said that outbreaks are inevitable, but epidemics or pandemics are preventable. The next speaker does a lot of that prevention. Um, and I'd like to introduce Beth Bell, the director of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Affections in CDC, and very in involved in the domestic Ebola. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I think I'm also part of the looking back part of this panel, and I thought what I would do um, would be to just uh, provide um, a bit of uh, background and, and framework and give you some examples of um, what we've had to do. Uh, we, loosely speaking, the CDC, with a very large group of uh, partners from around the world to respond um, to this um, uh, epidemic um, that was before us. I think that understanding some of the issues or, that we have struggled with and grappled with are useful in terms of helping to inform um, how we uh, try to avoid this sort of thing ever happening again. So I just um, first wanted to start um, by reminding people, I don't think people need to be reminded, but of the magnitude of um, this catastrophe with over 10,000 people um, having died and, and um, close to 15,000 cases and rising. Um, there are a couple of points I wanted to make here um, before um, I go on, and this is just a curve of uh, the cases in the three countries, uh, Guinea in red, Sierra Leone in blue, and Liberia in green. And you can see here um, the, um, at the sort of um, exponential rise in cases in Liberia. I think many of us will never forget that, having uh, been involved in the situation. That Sierra Leone, uh, in fact, surpassed um, uh, Liberia at the peak, um, but is a few weeks behind in terms of uh, the shape of the curve. Um, and, and that uh, we're now at a place where um, we still, and I'm going to say a couple of words at the end about getting to zero, uh, still are um, not um, seeing um, things going down the way we would like to see in Guinea um, and redoubled efforts in Sierra Leone um, that we'll see over the next few weeks um, how, they, uh, how well we do. And as Michelle mentioned, Liberia, uh, unfortunately, after almost um, a month of no cases, we've had a, a single case and now some additional cases. Um, I've noted on this slide a couple of um, points that I'll um, mention a little bit further. Uh, we in CDC activated our emergency um, operations center in July, early July, and as you've heard, WHO uh, declared a public health emergency uh, in early August. 
Uh, we've been talking some about uh, fragile health systems, and at our previous session, uh, someone made the point about all the health systems are uh, fragile if they're sufficiently stressed, and I think that's certainly true. But um, at the same time, I think it's um, useful to reflect on exactly how fragile uh, these countries are where um, this uh, catastrophe has occurred. Um, they'd uh, just been recovering from uh, decades of war, and um, the situation is, was really actually um, quite uh, dire before the epidemic with a lack of infrastructure, um, overburdened public health and uh, health care systems. You've uh, heard some examples of the very small number of health care providers before the epidemic, and of course, tragically, many of them have died. Um, a very high population mobility and porous borders, which um, certainly played a role in the uh, early uh, transmission in the forested area at the border of the three countries and continues to be a challenge in terms of um, contact tracing and um, disease spread. The sheer, sheer geographic breadth of the area, I think, um, has uh, been a challenge. And of course, with um, the transportation uh, problems uh, facing us, uh, this um, was uh, certainly a very large uh, challenge, especially at the beginning. Uh, and then um, the kind of um, lack of knowledge and acceptance of Ebola. This has uh, been a, a challenge uh, all along. Uh, clearly, despite um, uh, lots of educational efforts, education clearly is not uh, adequate. Um, there's a lot of fear and stigma that need to be addressed. Um, there um, was a suspicion of outsiders and also, I would say, of the governments uh, themselves. And um, a lot of traditional beliefs which needed to be recognized um, and um, understood in order to uh, really uh, get the uh, people uh, behind um, addressing the problem. Now, there are lots of ways to think about um, the response strategy, um, and this is one that um, we've uh, kind of been using uh, at the CDC. First, thinking about the drivers of the outbreak, most broadly being unsafe care and unsafe burial. S and stopping the epidemic, um, kind of dividing that into five areas, um, incident management at the national and subnational level, so a system of organizing work so that people know what it is that they're responsible for doing, have some sense of what the plan is in terms of how to execute, um, and then some accountability and follow through. Um, adequate isolation and treatment capacity, and this is something I'll say a bit more about in a moment. Safe burials, restoring the healthcare system and infection control, and this is, I'm not gonna say a whole lot more about this, but I, I think it's certainly an important area for further discussion. I will say that I think this outbreak has highlighted in a way perhaps more than ever before uh, the pivotal role of infection control and um, the um, kind of uh, catastrophe that can occur when, inf when um, transmission occurs in healthcare facilities. I think this is something that um, we need, really need to address going forward. Really the entire healthcare system in these three countries collapsed and among other things we're um, seeing, we saw many um, related problems including uh, falling immunization rates, we currently have measles outbreaks that we're dealing with and, and many other um, very negative um, impacts on health in general. And finally, social mobilization and communication, which as I said, I think really need to underpin all of our efforts, and I'll say a bit more about that also. Some principles um, that I think we've um, applied over and over again include speed, flexibility, and um, front lines first. Um, the point that someone made previously um, about looking at things through a local lens um, I think has uh, really been pivotal in um, our uh, ability to move forward with um, solving this problem. I'm going to um, sort of divide things into two um, uh, periods, and for this first period, I'm, I'm going to focus on isolation and treatment, burials, and social mobilization. Um, if you'll remember that curve that I showed you earlier with the exponential rise of cases in the summer, um, the first issue I think that faced us is, is one piece of it is exemplified by this map from WHO from the end of August, which shows the bed capacity in Ebola treatment centers in the three countries, um, which um, red basically means no capacity. And so the first issue that we really had to address in order to move forward was to do something um, to have adequate places for safe isolation and treatment. 
Um, you can do all the contact tracing and the case identification you want, but if you don't have any place where you can safely isolate potential cases and safely treat patients, you really um, can't um, address the issue. So this was the first thing that um, was facing us. There are a number of reasons for this problem, including uh, infrastructure, uh, as mentioned. Um, not enough um, healthcare workers, Médecins Sans Frontières, had been doing uh, we're really heroes in this response, and we're doing an incredible job caring for patients. So they were completely overwhelmed, and there were not um, adequate uh, partners available early on to take on the, uh, this role. And so this was the first problem that we, that we writ large, had to address, and uh, was addressed in multiple ways with um, lots of uh, increase in infrastructure, with contributions by military. Um, and um, the governments themselves and uh, WHO and many other partners. Um, there was a, a real stepping forward by uh, many partners um, to provide um, care and treatment um, for e Ebola patients, um, and, uh, and including partners in health and, and many other uh, groups, um, the African Union, uh, doctors from Cuba, uh, a large international group that was assembled uh, to, address, to help address this issue. Another um, important component, however, were, um, was mobilizing communities, and communities actually took um, some of this uh, into their own hands and um, came up with some ways to safely isolate uh, potential suspect cases in their own communities. And I wanted to um, just give an example of a place where this strategy um, was uh, quite successful, and that's the Western Area Surge in uh, Sierra Leone. And this was really a ward-by-ward -ward approach um, with uh, community ownership and participation. Um, both uh, active surveillance and the response capacity were enhanced, and we did have to have adequate uh, bed capacity in order for this um, to succeed. Uh, but uh, really this was, uh, as I say, going from ward to ward with extensive social mobilization. Um, and with this uh, combined approach, really at the very, very much at the grassroots level and very much with ownership by the community themselves. Um, the, basically the back of the uh, outbreak in the western area was uh, broken. We still have actually more cases. Um, the, the western area is still a focus actually in this second phase, but um, this exponential rise was turned around uh, with this uh, was surge. Another um, strategy I wanted to mention um, is, uh, was implemented early in September in Liberia, and we call it the right strategy, rapid isolation and treatment of Ebola patients. And what you see on this figure um, is uh, the size and duration of uh, outbreaks. Um, the strategy basically involved very rapid identification of cases and very rapid response. And over a period of six months, um, using this strategy, which we have since um, implemented in uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Guinea, we found that we were able to decrease the size of these clusters and uh, cut their duration by about, uh, uh, about half. A few words about safe burial, which was also pivotal at this uh, first phase of the outbreak. There were, this was an area where uh, many partners uh, really uh, stepped up and we established and operated over 190 burial teams in the three countries and uh, coupled that with call centers um, where patients could be um, directed to treatment um, but also um, that safe burials could be arranged. There were a lot of um, kind of starts and stops uh, in this process, and um, there were a lot of uh, communications and uh, anthropological experts who um, spoke with communities and identified uh, problems with the burial team practices that were um, negatively affecting uh, ability for us to uh, implement safe burials. And, and I will say that there were some substantive improvements based on um, this information, which really was pivotal in getting this to work. We still have some challenges with, with uh, safe burials, but uh, nothing like what we were facing at this time. Um, I only was, I'm going to say a word about laboratory capacity to recognize the importance and to say that there's actually has, was, has been a very highly functioning um, consortium of uh, laboratories, including many, many countries from the EU, including Nigeria, China, Russia, ourselves in the United States, South Africa, 
um, and I may be forgetting another country, but um, with this um, consortium, relatively well-coordinated consortium, we were able to uh, provide RT-PCR testing in, in all three of the countries. The question of um, how, in, what a difference it might have made if we had rapid diagnostic or point of care assays, or at least as tests that were easier to perform than what we were um, needing to do with these uh, field labs, I think is also another uh, interesting area for further discussion. Now, um, uh, Dr. Piat just mentioned um, this um, uh, concern about um, uh, sort of resetting uh, what is, seems to be uh, acceptable and um, a new normal and how much we need to um, fight against that. And this figure is just one way of expressing that to say that even as um, the exponential curve uh, was turning in the other direction and cases were declining, so even in January there were more cases, uh, Ebola cases in West Africa um, than in any previous Ebola outbreak. So. Um, uh, again, the second phase of getting to zero um, is uh, extremely pivotal, and, and any cases of Ebola in West Africa are really uh, not acceptable. So this second um, period um, that we're in right now, which is getting to zero, uh, you could um, divide it and think of it uh, in a couple of ways, uh, putting out um, the fires where they're still burning. Um, that is uh, responding uh, to the, um, the, the places where cases are still occurring rapidly um, uh, identifying uh, and responding to cases, so the right strategy, which you could say is like um, finding the sparks and, and tamping them uh, down, and then uh, continuing to maintain a robust surveillance in areas where there aren't any cases. This uh, slide is uh, just to provide uh, an, a, a bit of an example of um, one pivotal part of getting to zero, which is about tracking and tracing, and about um, this sort of meticulous uh, public, basic public health work around contact tracing. And this example actually is not from this uh, phase of the outbreak, but actually um, from Nigeria. And this shows how Nigeria responded to a single imported case. Um, uh, and the magnitude of the, um, the job is, is really uh, pretty daunting. Uh, in Nigeria, um, they uh, essentially used infrastructure uh, that they built for polio and other responses and moved um, the entire uh, response uh, to focus on dealing with this one um, uh, case. Um, and um, they, uh, over a period of uh, a month or two, uh, traced 800 contacts, um, including 19,000 visits uh, to contacts. And this is just to respond to one, uh, the one single importation. It gives you the sense of the magnitude of the work involved with contact tracing. And this is the sort of thing that we're currently doing um, in all three countries, trying to actually um, know um, what, uh, you know, one of our metrics is the proportion of cases that come from recognized contacts. And, and that's sort of what this work is all about. Now, um, I um, have not really been focusing exclusively on CDC, but I did want to reflect for a moment on um, the magnitude of the response, the CDC response, uh, and what it's meant um, to all of us. Um, we um, have uh, deployed nearly 1,000 public health experts to the affected and neighboring countries, including uh, more than 300 um, people that are on the ground right now. And since we like numbers, I'll say that we um, calculated that uh, we've spent 40,000 person days and 2,000 plus deployments uh, uh, in the context of responding to this outbreak. Um, you can see some of the other things that we uh, were working on uh, in country, including um, uh, er in areas of infection control and laboratory. We've really been working uh, extensively with uh, emergency operations, with surveillance laboratory and data management, with contact tracing, um, and a case identification with infection control, with communications, and uh, with issues around uh, the borders. Um, I'm going to close here because I'm sure that my time is probably um, far uh, over um, by uh, just saying a couple of things about uh, looking forward. Um, I think that um, this um, tragedy, Ebola tragedy, is um, a prime example of um, why, um, how important it is that we actually build uh, capacity in countries 
um, so that um, uh, infectious diseases uh, can be uh, quickly identified and there's the infrastructure um, to respond to them and a corresponding uh, healthcare infrastructure. And um, the United, us uh, and actually many other countries now have been um, working on this global health security agenda. Um, which uh, has three priorities of preventing whenever possible, detecting rapidly, and responding effectively. And as I say, I think that um, the Ebola situation really um, is um, a prime example of how important it is for us to um, carry on with this work. The other point I'll make is also a point that Dr. Piat made about global response capacity. And I think when um, countries do become overwhelmed, uh, one of the things that we found uh, with the Ebola epidemic that is that the global response capacity was not what it needs to be, and I think that this is another area um, going forward where working with WHO uh, and other groups really need to um, address the issue of how do we respond quickly when a, a, a country's uh, own capacity is surpassed. So um, that's it for me, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Uh, our next speaker is Larry Madoff, who is the Director of the Division of Epidemiology and Immunization in the state of Massachusetts. Um, he is also pertinent for this panel, the editor of ProMed, uh, a web-based um, monitoring system for emerging diseases. Larry. So, um Thank you, Michelle and, and uh, Peter, uh, for, for having me, and also to uh, Jerry Kirsch and the CUGH for this opportunity. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here and sticking it out to the, the bitter end. Um, I, I know that um, in the last session this morning, um, Dr. Zhao and others um, pointed to, to, to many failures that have um, been involved in this uh, current uh, Ebola crisis. And uh, there have certainly been plenty of failures to go around, of failures in economics and politics and infrastructure and lab capacity and the development of drugs and, uh, and vaccines and uh, really just a, a failure of will in many ways. But um, I, I, I want to talk to you about one particular um, failure. We in, at ProMed and in the, um, the non-traditional um, disease surveillance community, the, the biosurveillance or epidemic intelligence uh, or event-based surveillance, as, as WHO calls it, um, pride ourselves on being early with uh, reports of, of emerging disease outbreaks. And um, I think uh, we weren't this time. And I want to talk about uh, some of the reasons for that. And um, hope, hope uh, we're looking backwards and looking forwards. I want to also look, look ahead at some of the ways that we hope to improve the picture going forward. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about the response to Ebola. Um, much so, so some of the early responses that began um, um, a little uh, less than a year ago with um, the, the really heroic efforts of, of Médecins Sans Frontières and, and others in, in, in response to Ebola, and uh, the, really the ratcheting up of the response that occurred last summer. But we really need to remember that the first case, the index case, um, went back to 2013. Um, and in this uh, photograph here, the, the baby, um, uh, was, it was a baby photo of the two-year-old who was probably the index case of Ebola who died in December of 2013, followed by several other members of his family. So um, we really missed what was going on here. Now, this was in a remote part of Guinea. Um, as I said, the infrastructure and communication were poor. The healthcare system was, was you know, war-ravaged and nearly non-existent. But, um, but nonetheless, this was um, uh, you know, over a year ago. And this um, familiar um, epi curve, again, shows how far it trails out to the left back to, to 2013 when these initial cases occurred. And it wasn't really until we reached kind of the log phase of this outbreak that there was um, even recognition, never mind response. So, what was going on in these early days of, of the response? So this is um, 
this was just published last week. It's uh, uh, Pierre Formentis' um, blog postings on, on what they knew about going on. And he mentions that the very first reports that they heard about the Ebola outbreak were on the 14th of March. So some two and a half months after the index cases occurred, they had a vague notion that something was going wrong. And it wasn't until March 21st that they really got a positive lab result. Um, and so it was a, there was a long delay in the response um, and, and in the, even in the initial recognition of the crisis. Um, going back um, and retrospectively looking, um, this report from our colleagues at uh, healthmap.org noted a news report on March 14th, again, one of the very earliest reports talking about um, a strange fever in, um, in, in Macenta, in this area of, um, of Guinea. And uh, even this was not really recognized as being um, Ebola or even a hemorrhagic fever at this point. So I just want to mention a word about ProMed um, uh, that, that Michelle mentioned. Uh, I've, I've been the editor of ProMed for, some, for, for several years now, but ProMed actually is in its 21st year. Um, and has been um, really one of the pioneers of doing non-traditional surveillance of infectious diseases. It's a series of moderated email lists. I'll give you a web link at the end of the talk on just how to sign up for this. We currently have about 75,000 people in essentially every country who participate in ProMed, and I use the word participate because it is in some senses a social network. It's a two-way system meant to both send and receive news of, of outbreaks. And uh, we also have a system of regional networks, including one in um, Francophone Africa. Um, however, it too was um, missed the, uh, the early indications of this outbreak until, uh, until March. This is a, 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 a screenshot of our website, and you can also go there. You click on, on um, news reports, it shows you a map of the area, shows you a report of the area. And this was our very first um, report on the uh, Ebola outbreak, um, and it appeared on uh, March 19th, so a little over a year ago, and was one of the very first reports that actually mentioned the word Ebola in connection with this outbreak. And uh, you can see that it was an undiagnosed viral hemorrhagic fever. It came from uh, a Kenyan media report, actually. And uh, as, as all ProMed reports do, this came with a moderator comment from Dr. Marjorie Pollack, one of our, our, our epidemiology moderators, who um, really astutely noticed that um, the, the report talked about um, contacts being, the patients, the affected patients being in contact with um, deceased or, or, or otherwise handled bodies which of course is one of the hallmarks that, uh, that, that, that were mentioned as being part of um, the, the clinical picture of Ebola. Um, so why do we um, need to know about outbreaks? And I think um, um, we heard uh, Jeremy Farrar say in the last uh, session that, that surveillance is, is not sufficient and that's absolutely true. We need both surveillance and, of course, a response. And um, why is that? And so this is, I'm turning to the New York Times here, that astute journal of, um, of modeling. But this uh, New York Times infographic was, was actually a pretty nice demonstration of modeling of the infectious disease of the, of the Ebola outbreak. It used the um, CDC compartmental model. And it actually, this was published back in um, November of last year, and it pretty reasonably estimated based on numbers of, of, of November, and you can see here where it says, inter if intervention began, and it shows it beginning in August, which I think by all accounts is when really there was a, a robust response to this outbreak. Um, and you can see the size, the magnitude of the estimated number of cases occurring, which was not far off from where, where it actually was in January of, of this year. Um, on the other hand, this uh, same model shows what would have happened 
if intervention had begun as, as, as late as, as June. So this now moves the curve back to intervention in June. And you can see how much that is likely to diminish the response. So I think it underscores the importance of early detection of outbreaks and also um, the need, of course, for early intervention in, in, in an outbreak of this sort. So um, Paul Farmer this morning also alluded to another zoonotic outbreak that um, came from, from West Africa. And so I'm looking, I'm going to the looking backward part of this uh, for a minute. And looking back to, of course, this was the Sentinel report, um, the first publication of any sort related to the HIV AIDS epidemic, this 1981 MMWR report, um, noting a cluster of pneumocystis pneumonia in gay men in Los Angeles. Um, but of course, HIV AIDS did not begin in 1981. And there are estimates based on biological clock of the virus that it may have begun as early as 1930, and uh, that, that that's when you could date the crossover event. We know there are specimens of, of serum containing HIV going back into the 1960s. And so th this was clearly a failure of even greater magnitude, I think, to, to, to detect HIV like Ebola is not a subtle disease. Um, it's hard to imagine missing it and yet the world really uh, did miss it for, for many years. And I think it was this kind of this recognition of HIV um, that, that led to um, the development of more robust and more um, sensitive emerging disease detection systems like ProMed and our partners in, in, in event-based surveillance. Um, this is a, a graph of a study that we did um, several years ago looking at the time to outbreak discovery and to the time to public communication of an outbreak of sort of large WHO recognized events in emerging diseases. And you can see that over the years that time to outbreak discovery and outbreak communication has decreased substantially moving from, from left to right across these graphs from a couple of months to a couple of weeks by, by the end of this study, which was in um, 2009. Now, um, so, so we have made progress, and I think part of that progress relates to um, the use of innovative surveillance techniques of non-traditional uh, ep epidemiology, if you will. We also know that um, there are the use of multiple systems, both the traditional public health system um, as well as multiple innovative or event-based surveillance systems um, can be synergistic. And that by using multiple systems, you can, you can decrease the time to um, disease detection, to outbreak detection. And this just shows an example using H5N1 outbreaks as discovered by different surveillance systems, how the use of combined systems um, increases the time before um, official reporting that an outbreak can be discovered. So this is a, a case of, of using um, multiple systems. The, as, as we move forward, I hope that we will learn to use um, data outside of the healthcare system more and more um, to detect and, um, and, and determine when an outbreak is occurring. And the growth of the internet, both um, in the developed world and increasingly in the developing world, um, I think it is, is a way that we can harness that information. Of course, the trick is in innovating, in using new techniques, new methods for sipping from this fire hose of information and making meaningful sense out of a lot of data. Um, and there are a lot of, of innovations out there using everything from cell phone usage data to um, the uh, temperature of your cell phone in your pocket to um, Twitter and, and Facebook and Yelp posts to, to feed information into the healthcare and into the um, disease surveillance system that I think going forward will help us um, harness that information and, and, and decrease the time to disease outbreak discovery. Of course, another um, factor that needs to go into this is um, our embrace of a One Health ideology 
that we can't just look at this as a human health problem, that we need to look at um, to our veterinary wildlife and agriculture and uh, plant um, and environmental colleagues for help in, in the early detection of outbreaks. Um, one thing that, uh, that ProMed is doing along with um, some partners that are listed on the slide here, TefiNet, um, HealthMap, and the Skoll Global Threats Fund is to try to use graduates of field epidemiology training programs around the world as eyes and ears for disease surveillance to both validate and help report on disease outbreaks. And um, this is something that I think will, will serve us well in the future. So it's not just about technology, it's also about building human capacity. And um, I'm just going to acknowledge um, some of our supporters and give you, oops, I'm going to go back to my acknowledgement slide for one second. There are, are, are many people who have supported this effort, and I want to thank them all and also um, give you a, uh, some, some places to go to find out more about ProMed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Um, now from the early detection to someone on the ground. Uh, the next speaker is Nahid Bedelia. She's the director, director of Infection Control at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases at Boston University and director of the medical response for the BSL-4 laboratory there. Thank you. I want to thank the CUGH and Dr. Piat and Dr. Barry for having me. Um, as was mentioned, I was in Sierra Leone um, both in August and November and then in January serving as a frontline clinician initially with WHO and then with Partners in Health. Um, let me see if I can get this to work here. Great. So um, what I really wanted to talk about is to, to become a little bit more granular, to talk about the perfect storm that Dr. Pia mentioned, and to give you a little bit more of an on-the-field um, perspective from the lens of my own personal experience, but also that of my co-frontline clinicians, both international and national. And then to take you a little bit into the major wins and losses that we've had. Um, I've had the fortune and ill fortune and the good fortune of being able to see this epidemic in August and seeing some of the wins and some of the losses that we've had in this period. And, and lastly, I want to elaborate on the current upcoming challenges that we're seeing in the field, um, hoping to sort of fill in and flesh some of the larger points that Dr. Bell had mentioned about the health systems issues that are currently uh, being faced in the field. I have no disclosures, and all the viewpoints are my own. So uh, can we go back? Yeah. This, uh, uh, Dr. Bell, you beat me to the punch with this sure. as well. Um, as was mentioned, um, the number of cases in the prior outbreaks, uh, the largest number actually was 420-something cases in Uganda in 2000. This is over 23,000 cases. So what exactly happened? And what were some of the conflict and sort of the challenges that we faced early on taking care of patients? Um, when I started, and again, most of my perspectives is from Sierra Leone, but I can tell you hearing from my co-clinicians, it's uh, some of the factors are very similar uh, in Liberia and Guinea as well. Um, Sierra Leone, as was mentioned, had a late start but, and a later epi curve, but has continued having cases only recently to see this drop in January and February. The, uh, and I can't really begin to talk about the challenges without talking about the number one um, reason why our hands were tied, taking care of patients, particularly in August, and that was the dearth of human resources. And there were so many factors, Dr. Piat started talking about it a little bit earlier, so many factors that related to this. When I was in Kenema, the WHO, there were four WHO expat clinicians and about four to eight uh, international local nurses for about 100 patients in an Ebola treatment unit. We routinely had to turn people away, particularly towards the end of my time there. How did that happen? How do we get to a place where that was the patient-physician-clinician ratio that we had? And some of that was because the media response, the fear that was created, certainly didn't help in garnering volunteers. But then there was no system in getting volunteers to the ground. I was lucky enough to get involved um, just through the network that I was involved with, the biosafety involved with the, uh, the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory. But beyond that, there was no roster, there wasn't a large existing roster 
um, of clinicians who had experience working with viral hemorrhagic features. And if you wanted to get trained, at that point, there were no training programs to get you to become facile enough to work in personal protective equipment to be able to do it safely and effectively. The other elements that sort of decreased the, the, clini the clinician uh, patient time were the fact that our contact time with, with patients was um, limited by personal protective equipment. We can spend about an hour, an hour and a half. I've already given you the patient-clinician ratio. Now imagine you can only be in there for an hour, an hour and a half at any one time. And then to add to that, the fact that these are patients with viral hemorrhagic fevers, and this is, in this epidemic, this was a largely diarrheal disease. It was a labor-intensive, nursing-intensive disease that required a lot of bedside care for these patients. And that is a cruel turn of fate, given all the other limitations that I've mentioned, because it's the very thing that we couldn't give that these patients needed the most. It wasn't rocket science. It was hydration. It was supportive care. The last parts that didn't really help with the recruitment and maintenance of a healthcare staff were lack of systems that, or at least early on, there, weren't, uh, there wasn't anything that um, was in the form of an agreement in terms of what happens when healthcare workers get sick, whether it's international staff or local staff. Um, before I left for WHO, I signed a life insurance um, policy, and I was signing a, a release saying that there was no guarantee that I could be brought back. And then the last part that didn't really help were the fact that the national government was already staffed as poorly, um, initially poorly funded, but then beyond that, the health systems issues that exist with the management part of it, many healthcare workers didn't get their pay for four weeks to eight weeks. And so there were a lot of healthcare worker strikes. If I wasn't getting paid and all my friends were dying, I wouldn't come to work either. So um, beyond the human resources component, um, some of the early things that really um, didn't help us in terms of patient care were the lack of, in, the inability to get quick laboratory results for patients that we admitted into our Ebola treatment units as suspects, those that fit the case definition, but perhaps had malaria, had typhoid. And by not having that, we basically kept those patients within the suspect ward around other patients who may have had Ebola for a longer period of time. And we also delayed the care that those patients who didn't have Ebola from getting them, getting them to go in other places where they may have gotten care, because we certainly only had you know, the Ebola-related um, resources within the ETUs. We also were plagued by poor data quality. Um, the human resources challenges that I mentioned weren't just in case management or clinical care realms. They existed in case finding. They existed in monitoring and evaluation staff. Um, I can tell you I was, at Kenema, I was one of three uh, ETUs that was operational, Ebola treatment use, operational in Sierra Leone in August. And we routinely had patients who came without names and died before they reached our unit. How can we trust a database where we missed so many people, potentially? The other are elements that I think made it difficult is that, as has been mentioned previously, I think, in a lot of other articles, that this particular outbreak, uh, the Ebola viral hemorrhagic fever features, uh, were underplayed. Most of the patients, as I mentioned, had typical diarrheal disease features. They look like cholera patients, and they look like patients with typhoid fever and other things, and that made diagnosis a bit harder. We also had lack of physical resources, um, you know, and this didn't get better for a long period of time, as was mentioned. This, was, this has been a sustained response. It's really been going on since last spring. But in particular, I think, you know, over the last six months, what hasn't helped, for example, is at some point in January, I wanted to take down um, uh, the personalized air purifying respirators, the astronaut hats that we wear, as you might have seen. Uh, they're generally available here for, for hospitals. And we wanted to use them in the developing world. We wanted to use them in West Africa. And the reason why is because we thought that would improve the amount of time that we can spend in the unit. All the PAPRs were bought up by US hospitals. The manufacturers didn't have any available for another six months. So the lack of not just those kind of resources, but simple resources as personal protective equipment and medications and other things early on were a bigger factor in this. The other elements were the lack of knowledge about what exactly is an effective way to treat these patients. Do we give them antibiotics? When do we give them antibiotics? 
what kind of fluid do we give them? And not having had that kind of clinical acumen from prior outbreaks, not enough of it, didn't help us during the care of these patients. It also didn't help that some of the major players dis disagreed in the kind of uh, personal protective equipment, for example, that you could wear, um, or other, other challenges such as, do you provide intravenous fluid? Do you provide oral hydration? And I'll give you my opinion on that in one second. Um, that lack of consensus created confusion at the point of contact with the patient, and um, sometimes felt that there was a disconnect between those who were actually providing care and who was those who were making the guidelines. There were other detrimental elements of the international response, and one was simple things uh, like the lack of commercial shippers. At one point in August, all commercial shippers stopped shipping to West Africa. Most of the airlines stopped flying, which meant neither resources nor, nor volunteers could come to our aid. At some point, we had to start deciding tomorrow, if we run out of aprons, do we go in to go see our 100 patients? And we created aprons out of tarps. That's, what, that's how critical things became. And um, other parts that really weren't helpful is uh, some international policies that actually made it difficult for volunteers to come back. I spent about two and a half months over the last six months in Sierra Leone. I spent a month and a half in quarantine of the last six months. So I have a very supportive boss and a, a very supportive employer, and that's possible. But I can tell you anecdotally, uh, four out of eight uh, American expats who were working with me in November in Port Loco had to either quit or were fired from their job because they were told don't come back if you plan to volunteer. So beyond that and the inability for people to actually take that much amount of time off and then to come back and then to face the disconnect at a time where they need the most amount of support from their community was difficult and also didn't make for a good sell for volunteers. Um, the last and then Along the same lines, I think, um, talking about some of the things that Dr. Bell talked about, the community and patient distrust, given the larger factors, uh, the societal factors, the historical factors of West Africa, and particularly in Sierra Leone, given the fact that it came out of a civil war uh, not too long ago, about a little bit more of a decade ago. There was a lot of distrust for authority, a lot of distrust for medical care. Um, I routinely had particularly elderly patients refuse to take pills from me because they were afraid that the reason I was giving them pills is because we were bringing them into ETUs to finally just do away with them because we're isolating them from community. That level of distrust requires a long uh, relationship with those communities. And, um, and I, I think that that didn't help either. So um, this is something that you may not hear in most of the talks. And I think it's so important to talk about these. These are um, many of the co-clinicians that I worked about talked about these ethical dilemmas that were unique to this particular situation in some cases, and in others are seen in many other humanitarian crises. The first is not being able to provide the kind of care that you know that these patients deserve because the limitations are from physical resources. The limitations are from what's available in front of you. But then also to not be able to provide that kind of care because the systems aren't in place. Do you, what do you do with the child whose parents have just been admitted to your Ebola treatment unit? You know that if they leave, stay outside with no support and entire family is being decimated by this disease, they don't have any chance of survival. The other part is how do you, um, provide patient care when one of the major limitations to providing that care is fear for your own security. You can't spend an hour, an hour and a half um, or more um, in PPE without getting exhausted, without having your physical um, senses being impaired. You can't do it safely. And if you get infected, that's yet another expat that makes it on the frontline news. And so what's that balance? If you get sick, if you get infected, you put your whole healthcare workers at risk. The balance between your own safety and the survival of your patients is a hard one to make, and it's one that not, not many people have had to face in other disasters. Then there is the um, decision that we had to make daily about who actually gets admitted into an Ebola treatment ward, even with case definitions. This is not black and white. Remember, the decision you're making is you may be admitting somebody who's potentially negative, so they may get an exposure to Ebola while they're in your treatment unit, particularly early on when their lab results may be delayed by a couple of days. But on the other side, if you don't 
place this person potentially with Ebola inside the ETU, you are risking um, further propagation of this disease in the community. And that decision, making that decision on a daily basis is difficult. Lastly, it's the, um, as you remember, majority of other healthcare delivery venues in Sierra Leone, and I, I could probably say Liberia and, and Guinea are the same way. Most of the other healthcare provision venues were closed. Clinics were closed. Hospitals were closed. So when we got ill patients that clearly did not have Ebola, the decision we had to make was, do I keep this person inside and give them antibiotics or whatever it is that I can you know, cure them over the next few days and risk giving them Ebola? Or do I discharge them without any guarantee that they can get care anywhere else and they may die from a preventable disease? There are many, many more, many ethical dilemmas, but those are the major ones that sort of keep running um, in cycles, I think, among um, all our conversations. So where are we now? As was mentioned, the number of ETU beds, um, we have more than enough at this point. You know, and thankfully, we've been able to get everybody who needs to be isolated inside. As you can see, this is from The Economist. In the top right corner, um, you can see the, the darker bar is the beds that are required. The lighter bar are beds that are needed. And in Sierra Leone, at least, we have more than enough beds. Um, so we have the health system's capacity, but it's in the setting of a larger system that, A, was pretty poor to begin with, debilitating, but they're also now being um, taxed with six months of, of this epidemic. So what have we accomplished? We have a more organized response. Um, we have command centers. But the geographical distribution and the widespread nature of this epidemic is not making it easy. We have better staffing. Last I checked at our Partners in Health ETU in Moforki, we had 10 patients and 40 staff, which is great. Um, we have better training. We have more auditing of practice. People are, WHO is coming in and doing infection prevention and control training and, and auditing of practices. We have more physical resources. Uh, we have improved laboratory capacity. And we have a better system for healthcare workers. What do we not have? we still have a limitation of the PPE as a factor. Um, Luann Freer, who is one of the clinicians in Partners in Health, mentions if our bodies would only let us stay in the hot zone for 90 minutes, some of our patients couldn't get care. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap up, I'm, um, as Dr. Berry is asking me kindly to do. Here are the roads, the, the issues are roads to limitations. Um, we have patients moving around again. They're seeking care. How do you provide care in regular hospitals without effectively being able to triage out possible Ebola cases from those that are not Ebola cases? Um, the other things that I mentioned here, getting workers back um, into their positions after they've been out for such a long amount of time is a difficulty. Um, certainly all the other factors that plague poor health systems are still um, factors here. I'm going to end this, and uh, Dr. Barry, you'll have to give me patience for a little bit to talk about this because this, I think, is important. I had the good fortune to work with survivors the last time I was there uh, who are going back to work with patients who have Ebola, and we're teaching them infection control practices. Here's the hope of what survivors may provide, and you've read a lot of this stuff already. Um, but the, they're plagued by their own issues. Most of them still have post-Ebola syndrome, a lot of our, you know, pains in their bones, a lot of issues with their vision and things like that. Most of them fall uh, an entire socioeconomic strata. Um, if you are an Ebola patient, all your belongings get burnt. And so if I'm an Ebola patient, I'll take everything with me, property deeds, certificates, but nothing that comes into an ETU leaves an ETU, which means that people lost a lot. And they're not only lost that, but they lost their national ID cards, they lost their social status and safety nets. So let me end at this, but I'll give you one story. Um, one of the survivors came up to me and he said, when I first was diagnosed with Ebola, I was uh, afraid to go in into you because I was told that most people died. When I finally became sick enough, I came in and um, they put me next to this girl who was 10 years old. I have never heard another human being cry for water as much as that little kid did for 12 hours. This was in the middle of the night where there's no healthcare workers available. And in the morning, she was dead. So the way that I would look at this is that it's 2015, and over 10,000 people died of thirst and dehydration, like this little girl. Uh, so we certainly can't forget this epidemic.
I think uh, the applause is well meeting. Thank you for being in the field. Uh, next speaker is Larry Gostin from Georgetown. He's a professor of global public health law. So I think you've heard from the entire panel about um, uh, the unconscionability of uh, this uh, epidemic. And as uh, uh, Peter Piat and Michelle Barry uh, began, um, there are a number of moral imperatives. Uh, and so the key question, I think, is why did a largely preventable um, outbreak spin out of control into an epidemic? What are the international rules, international institutions, and, and country actions and inactions that fueled um, this epidemic? Um, I think it's important as we look back not to blame individuals, but to look at the structural reasons why um, uh, we fail to, to, to bring this uh, epidemic under control. And so while much of this has been a look back, I'm the panelist that's supposed to look forward, and I realize that it's very late in the day, so I'm going to be very brief, Michelle, uh, and talk about just four structural reforms. Uh, uh, one is an empowered WHO at the apex, uh, robust national health systems at the um, foundation, then the international rules, which are the international health regulations, and then rapid response, and I'll try to be very brief. Um, so we need a, an empowered WHO at the apex um, that's able to lead according to its constitutional mandate. But there are a number of structural reasons why it wasn't able to do this. Uh, many of them are because uh, member states didn't act as stakeholders to empower the organization to do it. So, there are a number of uh, reforms that have been long suggested and finally are back on the table uh, with the executive committee and now coming before the World Health Assembly. Um, the first is, is that the organization needs funding that's commensurate with its worldwide mandate. Uh, the WHO's budget, an annual budget is actually less than the CDC's, which is really just for one country. It also only has uh, control over 25% of its budget. And I don't know any organization that can actually be robust and while it, it can't control three quarters of its budget because those, that three quarters is earmarked um, by donors for particular, um, for, for particular issues that may or may not be WHO's priorities. Uh, another structural reform is the regional offices. Uh, you've probably heard that in this case there was um, a lack of coherence uh, at WHO between the Afro region and headquarters. And what our aspiration needs to be is regional offices that are highly competent in understanding and meeting regional needs, but having coherence with national headquarters. And then finally, and to me most importantly, is the engagement with non-state actors, um, and particularly civil society. If we learned anything from the AIDS movement, and, and uh, several of the speakers have uh, talked about that, AIDS changed the world, and the reason it changed the world was because of civil society, social mobilization. But that's absent at WHO, and I think we need to, to create that kind of bottom-up empowerment. The second is to have robust national health systems um, with capacity building. In my view, uh, the principal uh, idea, the, 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 the key principle is mutual responsibility, that states have to have a responsibility for, their, for, in, for providing their own health systems, and, and many states haven't abided by that, including rich states and poor states. Uh, if you look at the Abuja Declaration, for example, uh, and the failure of um, African heads of state to li live up to the, to the uh, promises that were made there, and one could talk about the Paris Declaration and many others. Uh, and the other is uh, international assistance to try to, to bridge that capacity gap 
Uh, and uh, as we saw with uh, this outbreak, uh, the response was robust, but very, very late, too late before the epidemic curve um, was um, uh, out of control. All of this is governed, supposed to be governed by international rules. Um, and that international governance framework is supposed to be the international health regulations, which were substantially revised in, in um, the aftermath of SARS uh, in 2005. And they were supposed to be the blueprint um, that we were going to use to attack this epidemic. Uh, and if there were ever a case um, why WHO was created and why the IHR was implemented, it would have been Ebola, and why didn't it work? Well, the first thing is, is that the international health regulations require core capacities, core health system capacities. But if you look, most countries in the world have not um, developed those capacities. Um, the assessment of that development is a self-assessment, and if you actually look back to the three most affected countries during Ebola, they didn't even report um, their health system capacities to WHO. No one followed up. Uh, the other part of this is the international response because the IHR require uh, higher income governments to help bridge that capacity gap. Uh, and again, uh, countries never did it. Uh, the IHR, uh, after um, uh, the polio outbreak, after uh, H1N1, and certainly uh, now with Ebola, have so-called recommendations that WHO made. And WHO recommendations were largely flaunted um, throughout uh, the international community and in the countries themselves. There was fear, there was stigma, there was separation. Uh, more than 60 states uh, implemented travel restrictions or travel bans. Uh, airlines um, canceled flights. There were quarantines in the region, um, such as in West Point, Moro Monrovia, and here in the United States, which really impeded the response in significant ways and violated what WHO was telling states to do under the IHR. But there were no compliance enhancing functions and then finally, we've heard a lot about the idea, not only of early detection, but rapid response. And so one of the really core gaps that, that I saw um, uh, leading up to the Ebola uh, epidemic was the fact that when WHO cut its budget um, very significantly, I was actually in Geneva at the time, and it was very shocking um, to uh, the worldwide staff at WHO, they cut very much their um, epidemic response uh, uh, capacities. And the idea was is that we would mobilize funds in the event of a humanitarian crisis. But what Ebola showed so clearly and what we should have known earlier is that you can't wait for a crisis, particularly an epidemic, before you mobilize funds. You have to have those funds those resources in place, not only economic resources, but as you've heard, human resources. And so the kinds of structural reforms that are on the table now include an emergency contingency fund, um, which the independent review uh, after H1N1 uh, recommended but was never adopted um, by WHO, uh, a global workforce reserve that Michelle Barry um, was, uh, uh, had uh, put forward and so did um, the Feinberg Report after H1N1. Uh, Jim Kim at the World Bank is talking about a pandemic finance facility uh, to use some kind of innovative uh, funding mechanisms such as uh, using the reinsurance industry. Um, but all of these things would only be to mobilize before to be prepared for a disaster. What we don't have is the very core basic infrastructure, health systems that countries need. And so what I would like to see is some kind of an international health systems fund to build the capacity, not only for uh, emerging threats, which are real and important, but beyond the securitization of, uh, of uh, global health, we need to provide services 
not just for epidemics, but for endemic infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, mental health injuries, and others. If you actually look at Ebola, probably more people died unnecessarily from diseases other than Ebola in West Africa than of Ebola because we lost the capacity uh, to care for them. And so uh, what we want is a world, I think, uh, that has global health with justice. Uh, overall health improvement through strong health systems and an empowered WHO, but more equi equitably distributed across the globe so that we can actually give the benefits of technology and of resources and access to health um, to the world's poorest populations. Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you. And our last speaker um, is um, Dr. Wally Tamori. Let me just uh, get the correct thing. Um, Professor Tamori is the president of the Nigerian Academy of Sciences. Um, he is a professor of virology and served as the regional virologist for the African, the whole WHO African region for many years. Um, he's also a member of the WHO SAGE expert, and he's going to give us his SAGE perspective um, from Nigeria as well as Africa. Thank you very much. Um, I was actually beginning to think that my paper will come at the 2016 conference, you know, <laughs> at the rate we're going. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, let, me, let me start by saying thank you for waiting this long. I mean, you're wonderful. Uh, let me also say that um, there are many things that they've said which I wanted to say, so there's no way I have nothing else to say. But also to thank them grudgingly, really grudgingly, because I have nothing more to say, and for the, for pulling the carpet off me, you know. But that's okay. Uh, you know, there are certain things we don't talk about publicly, and those are the ones that are causing our problems. All they have said, yeah, we can talk publicly. There are certain issues we skirt around. We we talk hush hush. We don't address, and they continue to cause the problem that we have. We talk about fragile health something. When did it start? It didn't start with Ebola. It started with independence in the 1960s when we didn't do what we should have done. And then it piled up, piled up, until we have fragile health structures. If we don't address those things, come 2035, Ebola will come back, and we'll be sitting down in this place and discussing the same thing. Well, let me go on with my, where are the best two? Green goes forward, I think. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. So the real thing about Ebola in, in West Africa uh, is going to come, don't worry. I think uh, Ebola came to West Africa spreading and swimming in the ocean of national apathy, denial, and unpreparedness. 1995, I was also with Muyembe in Kikwit. And what I, what, when we got to the Kikwit hospital, it was a woman. And she was waiting, Willie, 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 and she sat on for the next two, three hours. She was the wife of the first laboratory person who died of Ebola. And that song was always in my heart. For months, I wake up at night just hearing Willie, Willie. And then I decided that this must not happen again in Africa. At that time, some money was collected. Uh, even Mobutu put some money into that. But when it was time to spend that money, Africa was not called. I remember that part of the money, we, or that money, we went to Peter Pius uh, lab, I mean, uh, Antwerp, to go and talk about Ebola in Antwerp. I followed WHO meetings to go to Sweden to talk about yellow fever. Are you hearing what I'm saying? These are, some of the, these are the things we need to address. These are the issues we need to talk about that you know, we're not talking about. Now, you've seen all these slides, so you can go to the website and see all the slides. So let me talk the things you will not find on the slides. Now, when we talk about fragile infrastructures, we talk about corruption. Well, we all sit down and say, oh, it's an African problem. Corruption is not only an African problem. Corruption comes in those issues that you and I talk about, in the aid that we get. 
And aid is not just in the commercial side of it, but it's also even the collaboration we have in research. The Bible says it is more beneficial to give than to receive. And if you check all of the things that have been happening about AIDS and collaboration between you and I, you have been the one that has been most benefited from it. Africa has Ebola, but who are the experts of Ebola? They're all sitting down here. They're not sitting down in Africa. How did they get to be? Because you got your funds, and you used it to develop yourself. And you made you yourself in a position that would be doing for me what I should be doing for myself. <laughs> These are issues that I think we need to begin to talk about. Let me talk about corruption in my government. I mean, we can't hide it. That was the problem that led us to where we are. If we abuse our money in with, with a proper way and build those hospitals, train our people, done all of this, is, we won't have fragile health structure. Thank you for putting up all those uh, uh, treatment centers in there. Uh, you will go. Let me tell you what will happen to them. First, we won't have people to man them because you can't train doctors in one day. Also, because they're going to lie there empty, my government is going to put a soldier at the board to guard that thing because that's where we're going to be putting some <laughs> contraband goods and want to keep it there. That's what it's going to be. Or we turn into a center for, for celebration, a, a, what we call a, a cel something center, I will call it. That's what most of those things are going to be. And we need to talk about those issues. We need to talk about the things that make all the difference. This thing doesn't seem to. You know that one, that the same story, that this is the one that has been the, the, the greatest epidemic that has occurred. It is still going on. Ebola is still going on. It is not over yet. So how did we get to this one? These are some of the things I'm trying to say. How did one single case become the embarrassment that it is now? Why was Africa so, so, so helpless? Why did it take this long for the world to come? And why are we in where we decision where we are? The decision will continue unless we address those issues, unless we address the attitude, attitude of the people to what we're saying. It's the people that are suffering. Unless we have leadership that will care for their people, unless you will bring up those issues when we talk, not about whether there's you know, the USAID is giving one. Let me give you one, some good examples so that I can go and sit down because I know you want to go. 1996, CSM came to Africa, across the whole of Africa. And the only reason why we acted was that Saudi Arabia said they were not going to allow anybody to come for the Hajj. And the, my, my, my people who want to go to Hajj and things of that nature thought those are people in positions so they decided that something must be done. So in 1997, we decided we wanted to have what we call the Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response. Thank you, USAID. USAID gave, I can't remember, 84 million. But what did they do? They did not give the money to Africa. They gave it to CDC. So CDC managed the money. But we are right, because I will show you a slide at the end that when you give us the money, we probably will misuse it. So they gave it to CDC. But what did CDC do? They set up an office for IDSR for Africa in Atlanta. And then my office in, Abu, in, the, in, Ar in Arare, or wherever we were then, we, the, the guy who is the coordinator for that one had no seat. He didn't even have a computer. He was using my computer. And we're sharing one chair together. IDSR in Africa. But Arare, Atlanta had the computer and everything. That's what we're talking about. The one who gives the aid benefits more from it. These are issues that you and I should begin to begin to talk about. Anyway, let's move on before you drive me away out of here. Why is it? <laughs> So why is this epidemic well, the biggest it is? Yeah, we gave all sorts of reasons, we know. But the one that we need to address is our attitude, the way we look at money, the funds we have, the resources we have. People say Africa is poor, forget it. They've made us believe that, but I don't believe it. It is the way we use the resources we have that makes us poor, not that we're poor of resources. I think we need to remember that always. We need to remember. But you fooled up so much that we say we are poor, and we begin to begin to think that we are poor. We are not poor. I'm not poor. That's the problem. That's some of the points I'm saying. Also, let me just quickly go through that one. We know all the rules about the essential control of Ebola, all those things. Eh, Forum for Microbial, whatever, the American, they've been writing books since before I was born on how to deal with all these type of things. Why did we not apply them? Oh, this was not published in 2000. It was, the first one was in 2002. The other one was in 2000. I was even part of the one in the middle there. But what happened to the, all those things? Have we applied them? Have we used them? We leave this meeting, and we're going to write another wonderful report, which 
I know we wait for the next Ebola to come before we begin to talk about them again. Now, while we're talking about, uh, I was talking about corruption. Right now, while Ebola is going on in Sierra Leone, <laughs> they're taking care of the money for something that is not supposed to be. That is the audit report that came out of this current observing. It is clear from our audit conducted by the government itself that there continues to be lapses in the financial management of the system in Sierra Leone. And this has ultimately resulted in the loss of funds and a reduction in the quality of service delivery to the health sector. Don't forget the typographical error. When you have corruption, you also have corruption in your typing. So that's the basic. But these are, these are issues that I'm talking about. And unless we did, let me finally go to the last slide. That's what it shows in that, in that this is appendix, as I said. Withdrawal of money, miscellaneous account number, without payment vouchers, and without supporting documents. It came to about 453 million leon. So you bring the aid, and you think you've done a great thing. But at the end of it all, what happens? Half of the aid goes into the wrong place. We need to address those issues. Accountability, you know, attitude to things. You and I must begin to, and you must be one voice on that. We must, otherwise, we will continue to have the same situation that we have been. Or else, Ebola case came devastating and unprepared West Africa compounding years of misplaced priorities. Only time bringing another epidemic will reveal the lessons we have learned, if any, I'm not sure we have learned any, or the ones we have forgotten from the current Ebola epidemic. Let us not give David Bowie a chance to say that nothing has changed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, for uh, telling us some things that indeed are rarely mentioned at uh, this kind of conferences. And thank every uh, all the speakers. We have ten minutes for uh, to discuss um, one of the most complex issues um, of our time. Um, and, and, uh, and while we're doing the ten minutes, could people come to the microphones with their questions? Yes. So we can, we have probably time for three, four comment. Please uh, be very brief and uh, um, yes, and identify yourself and then uh, we can. Sure. Uh, Mark Miller, Fogarty, NIH. Uh, Dr. Tamari, I'm surprised you didn't actually comment on the tremendous success in Nigeria and uh, how you controlled Ebola. And I'm wondering if you can comment on how you overcame the challenges there. Like to... uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, because I was rushing, I didn't even praise myself because <laughs> it's, not, it's not often that you have such success. Um, I think, let me put it that way, we, we, it was a combination of fortuitous circumstances and a kind of bit of preparedness because we had an ongoing system, a very good system that was going on with polio and we made use of that. Why did I say fortuitous? The case came in already sick at the airport. Unfortunately, our doctors were on strike. All the public hospitals were closed. And so we took him into a private hospital. That limited. But as soon as that was known, and I think we must praise our government for that, they immediately declared that we had an emergency. And we made use of available facilities that was in the country to, to get that situation out. And which also brings me to a very important point, laboratory diagnosis. There are two laboratories in the country that were able to do quick diagnosis. And with that in place, and what's confirmed, even before we had laboratory diagnosis, government already began to do what needed to be done. And it, wasn't, it didn't come out that way. It was because we had dialogue with our ministers. We keep talking to them even before, uh, in preparation for that one. So I think with that, the, the role of the Polio Laboratory uh, Emergency Operation Center, we gave us a, a system to follow, the aggressive, follow-up of contacts, tracing of contacts, and, 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 and the, 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 the fact that uh, the government itself came up and provided funding at that time, you know, one of the rare occasions, but I think we must praise our government for that. I think we were <laughs> virtually mortally scared about Ebola and were ready to do what was right, and that what happened to us. Thank you. Well, there were four countries last year who were successful in containing Nigeria, Mali, Senegal, and DRC. So uh, I think it's also worthwhile just mentioning that. Uh, please, yes. And also I think you need the absence of bad luck is extremely important in life. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> 
Yes, please. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm an undergraduate at Harvard. Um, I think, as you all mentioned, the Ebola crisis has, in fact, sparked a lot of substantial s scrutiny on our institutional mechanisms for issues like, pu like global health security, public health pre preparedness, humanitarian response, et cetera. Um, and you know, as was mentioned, a lot of institutions have come under attack, um, humanitarian agencies, WHO, et cetera. Yet I think over the past year, um, one institution that's really been left out of the discussion, and left out of the scrutiny, is in fact the university and the academic, academic medical center. So it's, I think it's very fitting that we're here today, uh, united as universities discussing this topic. And I wanna hear from the panel, what are your thoughts on the specific roles that universities and academic medical centers should have played when the outbreak first, uh, I guess, was uh, known one year ago? And how would you evaluate that response over the past year? Thank you. So can I ask Michelle, we, if we're in one minute to, uh, is that, and then, because we, we have still a number of other speakers. I'll, 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 say, it, I'll say it very briefly, I think we failed miserably. Um, and there's a wonderful editorial by Lisa Rosenbaum in the New England Journal saying this. Uh, the CUGH uh, surveyed their members um, and there were tremendous barriers put up. A lot of those barriers, you know, um, Peter said he didn't go to his lawyers. Unfortunately, many of us couldn't avoid our lawyers. Um, there were issues with how are we going to medically evacuate people. I think Nadid talked very eloquently about that and some of the challenges. Um, but I'm not sure that we, as academic medical centers, sh should be the first responders. I'm not even sure that many NGOs um, in, in kind of a non-coordinated way should be the first responders. I think that's what uh, Dr. Gosson was talking about, is that there needs to be a strengthening of a, a global workforce and health systems, strengthening in the countries themselves. I hope yeah. that answered that, but we failed. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it would be useful for perhaps for CUGH to have a, you know, some reflection on that collectively. And, uh, you know, it's of course linked also with Many other things. Academia is not operating in isolation from the rest. Like in, in the UK, we have the National Health Service. So it's a completely different type of uh, setting, particularly for healthcare providers. Can I ask over there? I, can't, I can hardly see you, but there are two people waiting, and then we go there, and then we'll have to. I just want to add one, one little thing is CUGH now has a list of anybody who wants to be a responder yeah. from a, uh, an academic institution. Sign up. Right. So, very briefly, we have three speakers, and then we'll close. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Rashna Chinwala from uh, Dartmouth. I'm a trauma surgeon. Um, I, I'm not sure if some of the earlier speakers mentioned it because I, I missed them, but the blue whale in the room for me in the response of the world to Ebola is the lack of mention anywhere that I've heard over here about MSF's role in their response and the ability of the, and the lack of response to their call on March 31st to the WHO and to other agencies and their um, them being essentially called uh, fear mongers and calling this um, a pandemic when it really wasn't at the time, um, when it actually turned out to become a much bigger epidemic than anybody else thought it would. And I, I guess my, I am a proud former field worker from MSF and I have not heard anything here about the role of these kinds of NGOs, when they go in, they expend their entire budget and their, enti and their volunteers are asked to uh, give of themselves time and time again when the world doesn't respond. Where in all of this learning that we are doing from the mistakes that we've made as a global co a community, are any of the lessons to be learned from an organization such as that? Because they have the strategies in place to actually go to a, a country quickly, within 24 hours, land, do their thing and actually help people quicker than any governmentally constrained organization can. Where do we Thank learn you. from can them? Can you come to a conclusion because we need two more? Yeah. What is your, uh, do my, you have a question? Well, or? my question is how much of, has anybody talked to MSF about okay. learning from their experience? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes. They're members of uh, various panels and committees, but can I, the next one please, because we are, I have three minutes left. I was told that we have to... We, we can go a little bit over, five minutes. Sorry? We have five more minutes. Five more minutes, but two more speakers. So uh, two more comments. Okay, we, uh, I'm Francis oh, Maswa yes. from Uganda. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like not to agree with the last speaker that uh, if an outside agency 
can drop into a country and perform better than the local governments. If the local governments are prepared, there is no way an outsider can come do it better than the local people. <laughs> and that's also the reason I'm standing, to appeal for a change in the way in which we work together. Let's focus more on developing the capacities of local institutions and local systems than, you know, my brother, uh, Professor Tomori, has said it all. I would like to uh, request you to read the book uh, Nigel Crisp and I have released just recently, African Health Leaders. It addresses some of these issues, and I hope that when we meet next year, we will be hearing more what Americans are doing together with Africans rather than what I have heard the last few days, more of what is being done in my country, and I don't know about it. So that's my message. Okay, thank you, Francis. <laughs> and last, last comment. Hi, uh, Matt Murphy from Loyola Chicago. Um, a couple of things. One, um, there's going to be a high-level panel meeting of the WHO in Geneva next week at, uh, that's going to meet on the Ebola response, and I was wondering what um, you guys thought or how optimistic you were that there would be meaningful action and, and meaningful um, reflection um, from that panel. Uh, secondly, I'm wondering now after hearing some of our of the other commentators if uh, the CDC might reconsider uh, their stated objective of zero cases and instead reformulate as uh, attaining systems that can respond when there are cases. I think that might be a better objective. Um, also based on other experts talking about how there are, will continue to be epidemics of other diseases, not just Ebola in this region, and that we should have systems that can respond to those while responding to Ebola. So maybe that would be a better objective. And then finally, just a comment on the composition of the panel. I think it's so wonderful that a lot of stories have been really great, um, and a lot of experience and insight is incredible, but it's incredibly biomedically heavy, and particularly infectious disease um, heavy. And while I think that has wonderful and great insight, and I do appreciate the insight from um, the legal side, I think that to really understand Ebola, we need to have input from other experts outside of the silo of infectious disease and biomedicine. And it might have been interesting to see that reflected on this panel. So. Thank you. Um, as far as the WHO panel is concerned, my understanding is the report has to be delivered by the 15th of July, so we'll, we'll see. Um, would you, Beth, would you like? Um, yeah, I, I guess on the getting to zero, I would say that the objectives are not mutually exclusive. We must get to zero, and I think we need to continue to keep focus on that, while at the same time, we have to look forward and continue to work to build sustainable systems at the local level, as you, yourself and many other speakers have mentioned, so that um, we're putting um, systems in place and building capacity um, for countries to be able to respond, as you say, when um, an, uh, something li else like this happens. So I think the two need to go hand in hand. That is um, a lot of what the Global Health Security Agenda is about, is empowering local uh, countries to build their own capacity. But I think in the meantime, we also have to continue to focus on getting to zero so that, as Dr. Piat says, we don't find ourselves in a situation with Ebola endemic in uh, Africa. Thank you so much. I think uh, this was a, a terrific end of uh, CUGH, and I, uh, we can now go to the formal um, end. Thank you very much to the whole panel and for all the speakers. Thank you. So I, I just want to add my thanks to the panel for a very important and powerful session. Um, so I hope you had the chance to learn something new and to meet someone new because we are coming to the close. And so the only task left uh, besides saying goodbye is to hope that you will give us that feedback that Jerry talked about so that we do come together in San Francisco next year, we can even 
do better, as hard as that may seem, given the outstanding job that was done here. I'd like to thank all our speakers for the last three days and all of the audience for everything they've done. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Kirsch to briefly come up, exhale, and give us a short summary of the last three days. Uh, short summary, it was great. Um, thank you all. Um, we can always do better, as uh, uh, Tim mentioned. Um, your feedback will be extremely helpful. Um, I want to call on uh, Jaime Sepulveda, who will be taking on responsibility for organization of the meeting next uh, year. Um, Jaime, come on up. Um, he leads the um, Global Health Sciences Program at UCSF, and we want to continue to uh, develop this meeting. Um, uh, I don't agree with the perspective of the last uh, speaker that uh, we were overly heavy on biomedical and infectious disease. In fact, if you look across the whole program, um, it was exceedingly broad. But we have to continue to uh, find the best way to bring our academic institutions, this is the consortium of universities, to the forefront. Uh, to bring new knowledge generation, which is otherwise translated as research, uh, into education and, uh, and practice in the real world. Um, and I know Jaime will be working very hard on that. Jaime. Thank you. Three points in four minutes. First, um, in order to understand and anticipate the future, we, we need to know the history. The history of CUGH is a short but intense one. In 2005, here at Boston University, Jerry Kirsch organized a meeting with uh, leaders of schools of medicine, uh, schools of public health, institutes of public health. And that was where the notion of getting together and uh, learning how to have a larger impact was started. Later on in 2007, we held a conference in uh, San Francisco, chaired by Haile de Bas, where the notion of a consortium was uh, further developed. So what is the future uh, for CGGH? My hope is that we will continue evolving from a consortium of universities on global health to a global consortium of universities all over the world focused on improving health outcomes. Um, a word of recognition to the visionaries, um, Haile de Bas, first of all, and Jerry Kirsch, who got this started, but also to um, Judy Wasserheit, to Tim Brewer, who have carried the torch forward, and uh, I'm sure Pierre Perkins will do the same. Judy Wasserheit, by the way, put me on the, stop, on the spot the other day uh, during the conversation, the debate, this old debate about the vertical and the horizontal when it came up, and she asked me to comment on the diagonal. Fact is that it's hard for me to believe that we're still discussing this false dilemma. False because we need both. In Mexico 30 years ago, we developed the concept of the diagonal approach in which health priorities became the drivers of change in the health system. And in my humble opinion, health system strengthening is a means to an end, not an end in itself. The whole purpose of health systems is to improve health and reduce inequities. Uh, health systems need a sense of direction and also a sense of urgency. The change of paradigm we did in Mexico was to make the health system from passive, waiting for patients to come, to very proactive, having the health system go to communities. And our motto was um, affordable health solutions delivered for measurable population impact. And I think that's what we want to do. 
So there's a, a loyalty program for whoever subscribes to the diagonal approach. Um, you will get points every time you mention diagonal approach, redeem, redeemable in bitcoins, hopefully. Um, Julio Frank has been my champion so far, but um, you can join the program. So on behalf of the organizing committee of the CUGH 2016 to take place, as you all know, um, April 2016 in San Francisco, we, we invite you all to attend. My colleagues, uh, Pat Conrad, Steph Bertossi, Michelle Barry, Tom Coates, of course, Tim Brewer, Keith Martin, and the wonderful staff of CUGH uh, will be part of that organizing committee. And we will ask uh, Jerry Kirsch to give us also his uh, lessons learned and uh, post-mortem of this meeting. Premises and promises. So the premise is our strong belief that universities have a moral imperative to help advance health worldwide. The promise is to have an equally fun and intellectually stimulating meeting as we just had here in Boston, but with much better weather. See you there. So let me leave you with the words paraphrased of one of Boston's uh, famous native sons, Leonard Nimoy. Live long and help others to prosper. Have a safe trip home. Thank you very much for coming.